In this episode, you're going to learn about the most effective application of design to address the global pandemic. We're going to talk about the success and sometimes the lack of it of design in the social sector. And finally, we're going to talk about the rise and fall of design thinking. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. I'm Linda Pulick, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 102. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies that help you to build services that win the hearts of people and business. The guest in this episode has a deep passion for doing work that makes a positive impact on social sector. She's a teacher and she's the founder of Studio Stella. Her name is Linda Pulik. The reason I'm so excited to share this chat with Linda with you is because we talk about design for the greater good. How can we use our skills as a community to help to create a better society? We're going to talk about some of the lessons Linda learned from the past, what works, what doesn't, and what can we take from that into the future. Linda definitely gave me a lot of food for thought about where design is today and where it could be tomorrow. So enjoy this episode with Linda Pulik. Let the show begin. Welcome to the show, Linda. Hi, Mark. Good to have you on. Um, really excited about what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I appreciate that you're up early for this uh, for this episode. <laughs> for the people who don't know who you are, could you give like a very interesting but brief introduction? <laughs> um, I will try. Uh, so I am a designer. I've been doing it for quite a while. Um, I I like to focus my, my the focus of my practice is really on. Um, providing services to people for free who des deserve world-class service for free by virtue of the fact that they are citizens or residents or constituents of a nonprofit. Um, I, that's not really an accident. I started my professional life as a public servant. I was a, a public high school teacher. And uh, so that has remained very important to me. Uh, of course, you know, I've worked in industry, um, the latest, uh, the, the last employer that I had, I'm now, now working on my own, but the last employer that I had full time was, was Fjord. And of course there we, we worked across industries. Um, I'm also a teacher. So I, uh, um, a few years ago, I, I decided to stop teaching design to design students, and then I, I now teach design to public policy students. Mm -hmm. And we met through Robert, who was uh, on the show a few episodes ago. Um, service design, the term service design. Do you recall the first time you bumped into it? Yes, I do. Um, it was probably... Um, it was more than 10 years ago, uh, and uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, um, Dennis Vile, who is now the dean at the Institute of Design, um, but used to be the VP of design at McDonald's. So Dennis used to talk about service design a lot, of course, you know, at, at the time he was uh, a leader in the service industry. And um, I came to understand that service design was really a, a, an extension of human-centered design, um, you know, just a very holistic view of how the design process could help business and, and um, other types of organizations. And it was shortly after that that I uh, went and worked in India, which is, in my opinion, the homeland of service design. I, I feel that... Uh, uh, in India, uh, service design was really invented in India before it had a name in the West because the approach that um, Indian businesses and, and organizations have to service and really looking at, you know, that the whole of what a service really means um, is done very, very well in that country. It comes naturally to hmm. entrepreneurs. Hmm. It's an insight that I don't recall having heard on the show. So that's uh, that's interesting. 
Linda, we've got some big topics uh, on the line here for for today. Are you ready to start and do some interview jazz? Yes, I am. Very well. First topic. In times like these, and for the people who are watching or listening to this later, we're in sorry, June 2020, and our big topic is the pandemic. Do you have a question starter around this one? Yes, I do. My question is, what if people who could make an impact in this epidemic listen to real experts? The, there, I feel that there's a lot behind that question. <laughs> yes, there is. Where is it coming from? Well, um, I know that, um, you know, that for a lot of us, uh, this pandemic is uh, what everybody here in the U.S. is calling unprecedented. So uh, it certainly is a situation that's unprecedented for many of us uh, in the West. Um, and um, I actually have been interviewing some friends uh, and experts in other parts of the world for a project that I'm working on to uh, design something to help people in crisis situations. And, and, and what I was expecting was that people in other parts of the world would say, this pandemic is actually not unprecedented. You know, we're used to going through things like this, but um, what I've been surprised to find is that, um, you know, a lot of people, particularly young people in other parts of the world, uh, are feeling very different at this time in history than they, they have before. However, um, in, in a time when everybody feels uncertain uh, and, and some of us want to contribute to making things better, people tend to jump in and uh, do what they think is, is the right thing to do to help. And um, in a situation like this, it is my opinion that um, we are best led, we will be best led out of this pandemic by medical and scientific researchers um, and uh, medical and scientific experts. Hmm. And um, a, a few weeks ago, I heard this uh, uh, Italian doctor speaking on the BBC uh, about his experience in northern Italy. Um, he was somebody who had worked for Médecins Sans Frontières, and um, he, he he contended that the right organizations to lead the world out of this pandemic were perhaps not even governments, but humanitarian organizations who could... Um, draw on their expertise in handling crisis situations that also included the, um, the social and humanitarian outcomes, uh, which I think brings me back to, brings us back to the role of service design in the pandemic. And, and how does it, uh, yeah, how does it tie into service design? Yeah, well, um, you know, service design, again, as I, as I referenced earlier, um, uh, you know, my, my own um, understanding of service design and the way I utilize it in my design practice is that it, it's a very holistic, human-centered way of, of approaching the creative process. And so um, I, I think that, um, you know, Robert talked earlier about um, designers and service designers being expert facilitators. And um, I really think that at a time like this, that's where our expertise is most applicable. So our expertise is most applicable in supporting experts, health and uh, science experts in deciding what the way out of this situation is and um, not being the people who stand in front saying, we know what the right way out is hmm. we really need uh, we really need to take a back seat here and provide a supportive role rather than be front stage. Yeah. So how can we um, guide, facilitate, enable, empower the people who have a different kind of knowledge about this kind of situations and uh, yeah, again empower them to come up with the best solutions. 
Right. Um, so we are experts of a, of a creative pro process that really works. And uh, in, in other disciplines like, like science and medicine, the expansive uh, and and uh, the, the expansive thinking and comfort with ambiguity that we really know how to manage um, is is not always part of. I, I know for sure it's not always part of the scientific method. Um, so my my first degree was in molecular biology, and I I always um, when people say that they think that that was a big jump, I, I really argue with them because uh, most of the best scientists were, um, were or are creative people. You have to be people who um, think, uh, you know, well outside the box, whatever the box mm, is. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think of that uh, physicist, I think in, in uh, Australia, who was trying to come up with a uh, therapy for coronavirus who ended up going to the emergency room with magnets up his nose, um, which was kind of a hilarious, um, and, you know, situation. And, and luckily it had a positive outcome, but, um, you know, the idea that, that that person seemed to have gotten so excited about a, a, a creative or novel idea, um, is it, it, we as designers, um, can offer our expertise to be the, the stewards of that process in addressing something like um, COVID-19. And uh, I've got two questions around this. One is, um, what can we do uh, more than we're already doing? Like, uh, where is the part where we sort of, uh, what's, the, what's the English phrase, not picking up the ball or let, let, letting the ball loose, something like that? Uh, and I already forgot my second question. So where where can we step up our game? Like what, what can we do more? Well, uh, that's, I mean, that's been something that I, you know, sitting locked up like everybody else have, um, have uh, thought about. I mean, we can do the same things that everybody else um, is doing. Like I'm making masks, we can donate blood and you can listen to public officials and stay inside and, and not endanger other people. But um, uh, in addition to that, um, I think that we have an opportunity to join forces with um, humanitarian organizations. So for example, I've been a, a Red Cross volunteer and um, I, uh, the, the, the project that I'm working on, I plan to um, give to one of the, the um, humanitarian organizations that I've, you know, that I have friends working at or that I've been affiliated with in some way um, and have them be the client um, and decide whether or not um, that is is useful to them. And in the, in the process of creating that, I am also speaking to people who work for organizations like that, um, because it's a it's a challenge to uh, you. You can't really approach somebody working for one of these organizations now because they're swamped. They don't have the time to initiate a new design project with you. And so. Um, uh, one thing, if you are not already involved in in working with an organization that is um, directly addressing the pandemic, I think is to um, is to do a service design project on your own and and um, give it as a gift to uh, one of these organizations. So I'm not sure whether um, whether you've heard of the the WHO uh, call for creatives, but that's also an opportunity for um, designers and other creatives to uh, contribute to this effort by supporting a, a humanitarian organization. The call for creatives by the, double, the WHO, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, not cool, the pandemic, but let's see if we can step up our game. Um, Linda, let's move on to uh, topic number two, which is closely related to, uh, I guess, to your heart, uh, because it's about the social sector. Have, do you have a question starter? Yes, uh, my 
Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. I, I saw a sneak preview. All right. So my question is, how far sh how far should designers um, insert themselves into the social sector? Uh, so this is something that I've been thinking about for uh, quite a while. Um, seven years ago, my friend Siobhan Gregory and I presented, uh, we did a talk at the Design Research Conference at uh, the Institute of Design about this, and, and not everyone was, was happy with, <laughs> with what we had to say. Um, uh, Siobhan is a, she's a designer, but, but also an anthropologist. And, and one of the things that we were advocating was, um, you know, that designers spend more time with the people that they are designing for and design with them rather than swoop in, um, and, uh, tell them what to do and then, and then leave. And, um, so we, um, you know, in addition to proposing that, that people slow down, what we were suggesting was that, uh, designers are not the leading experts. So we need to, what we need to do, um, you know, as I, as I referenced earlier in speaking about the, the, the pandemic is to understand what our expertise really is and to provide that expertise to people who are already doing that work well in their communities. Where do you feel that we are sometimes stepping over the boundary of what our expertise is? Well, I think, I think part of the problem, um, one of the causes of overstepping is that uh, our discipline, design as a, as a discipline, as a profession, comes from industry. It's a commercial uh -huh. practice, and uh, design consulting is, is very effective, and um, our, our, our process is very repeatable. Um, it's very successful in a business context. And so um, part of what's problematic is when you... Um, when you try to design in an environment where time moves at a different speed, it, it, in some ways, time time moves a lot faster in the in the public sector. So, um, I mean, now is a great example. You know, uh, here in this country, um, policy and and the political environment changes in seconds because of a tweet, hmm. uh, and um, uh, so, you know, um, I, I remember once, uh, working on a tax project and, and, um, you know, tax law, uh, here in the United States as well changes more than once a day. At least it did when, when I was working on the project. And so, so in that way, um, you know, it's very challenging to be a designer for an organization who has to contend with with changes in, in funding and policy that move at that speed. But then um, in other ways, things move very slowly. So uh, we're not per se stepping over our expertise, but we have to adapt our expectations or be more flexible, be more in the moment rather than quite, are we too rigid? Is, maybe that's the question. I, um, Yes, perhaps yes. Um, th th I've I've never thought of it that way, but um, you know, because we've achieved such success in the commercial sector, um, and people are very impressed by what we deliver. You know, we can very quickly, um, uh, you know, mock up or visualize a new reality or a new future. We we tend to think that that success can be transplanted into an environment which moves both both fast and slow uh, at the same time. And then um, also where resources are scarce. So the, the seedlings that designers provide for, you know, the organization to plant and, and you know, grow a new future or, you know, develop new, new, new products and services. Um, unfortunately, 
they may not have the resources they need to take what we give them to to develop, uh, you know, what they've created. Um, and and that has happened to me, by the way. I'm not suggesting that I've always been successful in all of my my forays into you know the social sector. Yeah. So the the like, if you could give one or two. Uh, pieces of advice for designers who want to do good in the social sector and based on your learnings, maybe based on the mistakes that you've made in the past, like what, what would you say? What kind of advice would you give? Well, I, I would say, um, first of all, slow down. Um, don't expect uh, success to come overnight and, and be prepared to stay for the long haul. Uh, you know, so when I think of, of, some of the most successful partnerships that I've had um, in in uh, in the social sector. One was with a um, a, a doctor in Uganda, um, and that that partnership was nine years long. Um, the 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 project that we got the most press for, and that that I guess in some ways was the most successful. Um, we, we weren't able to realize its scale, um, but our, our working relationship was actually very successful. Um, you know, I, I currently, um, have been working with, a, a local social services organization, um, as a designer for about five years and my, my collaboration with them, um, continues. I don't expect, um, you know, I don't expect a big flashy success um, and for the world to change uh, even in a year. And if the world does change, it's because the people that I'm working with make it change because they've been on the ground doing the work for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm. Good tips. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, setting, uh, being a bit more humble, for being in there for the long run, n not going for uh, fame and fortune. Uh, yeah, I, I recognize a lot of things. Let's let's move on oh, into. By way, yeah. By the way, I I don't want to suggest that that good intentions um, and the desire to help is is a bad thing. I don't. I don't think that at all. You know, I think it's really. Um, for me, it's been really um, heartening as an educator and, and you know, even um, even in the jobs that I've had to realize how many um, new designers, uh, you know, want to orient their their career and their practice in this direction. Um, and so um, I'm not suggesting that, you know, everybody in the design world is just rushing in and, and, and wants to get it done in five minutes and, and that's that. Um, I just think that people will be more uh, fulfilled in this space if they, you know, if they realize that they need to be in it for the long haul. And it's good that somebody tells them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Linda, let's move on to uh, the third and final topic of today, um, which surprisingly hasn't been on the show in the past few episodes, months, maybe. Um, that's a topic of design thinking. And I'm sure you have an interesting perspective on this. So oh, do, you yes, have, I do. <laughs> do you have a question starter? Yes, mm. my question starter is um, how much design thinking is too much? Hmm. <laughs> Again, a loaded question. Right. <laughs> how much um, is how much is too much? Well, my answer ten years ago would have been uh there's never enough design thinking. No amount of design thinking is too much. And um, now and today. And now now I think that um that once you enter the design phase, too much uh, design thinking, capital D, capital T, design thinking is too much because unfortunately, I think that the the campaign that started was started uh, in part by designers. Um, it, it succeeded, you know, it was extremely successful. And, you know, three years ago, working inside an organization that very successfully um, 
rolled out design thinking and, and um, you know, educated thousands of people in, in how to think creatively, you know, and, and use design methods in their, in their uh, work. You know, it was super, super exciting to be inside that. But um, I do think that, um, unfortunately, uh, one of the problems with, with uh, design thinking um, is that it has become a, a discipline unto itself. And um, it's, it's, um, in, it's enabled people who have very little training in, in implementing design methods to think that they, they can dispense of designers in the thinking part of the, the process. So designers, at least in some of my experience, have been dragged back 10, 15 years uh, to the time when we were the people that, that make stuff look pretty, pretty because other people design think for us. We, we're no longer required to design think. Hmm. It's a, it's a painful observation. Yes. Hmm. It, it is. Is there, is there hope? Is there a hope somewhere? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, I think I think what's been good about it. Um, I was talking about this with, uh, you know, with a friend of mine, whose opinion is that um, this um, this is actually good for for designers because we have to, um, you know, we really have to rediscover now what 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 sets us apart. And just to go back to the beginning of our our conversation. Um, we really have to re, um, re, reinvent our expertise because, you know, the thinking methods that we have uh, encouraged everybody outside of our prof profession to use um, are, are well understood and well accepted and they're being, um, they're being applied. Um, but, but, you know, we, we need to we need to explore the margins of our profession a little bit and, and reinvent ourselves. Yeah, and maybe uh, get better at articulating what it is that we're actually, how, how we are differentiating. Like it's, yeah. it's when uh, it's not about running a workshop, it's about running an uh, engaging workshop. I don't know, it's at least uh, taking some effort to articulate and, and verbalize the thing that, that makes serves designers different from people who don't have a, a formal slash informal design training background experience career right a bit of um, feedback that i got recently was was from a client of mine uh you know they've they've hired um me um to be to be uh to provide them with design expertise uh they're not a design firm um and um, you know, when we were going through our initial pitch to explain the process, um, we, we deliberately cut the number of slides down explaining the design process. Um, we we cut, the, cut it down to one. Um, and um, afterwards, the feedback that we got was, um, you know, thank you for not going on and on about that because we already know about that. I mean, that's why... That's why we've we've um, asked you to work with us. Um, but what we're expecting is for you to provide us with something that we don't know and, and that we don't know how to do on our own. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really important uh, challenge maybe for the coming years, like showing where uh, the expertise and knowledge gap is. Like, okay, it's awesome that you have learned about maybe creative thinking, creative problem solving through a design driven approach but where's the gap between what you know now and what people who are more skilled and experienced do at, at least uh like, like you also said the positive thing about this is that the uh, the awareness around design that it exists and that it can create value has grown tremendously over the last decade absolutely and it's incumbent on us just like it is in every other profession or discipline, you know, scientists don't sit around bemoaning the fact that the, the, um, that the, 
methods and and tools and um, processes that they used 10 or 15 years ago are no longer relevant mm -hmm. you know they they it's their job to go out and and yeah. and you know re re reinvent their field which which i think um you know that's what we that's what we sell first, um, and yeah, so that's yeah. that's what design thinking has challenged us with. We we've democratized our field to a small extent, but now we need to sort of take it to the next level, which which is good. Maybe it's a challenge for for the community. Maybe we've gotten too complacent. Um, is there maybe something that you'd like to ask us, the viewers and listeners of the show? Yes, um, I'd like to ask the 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 viewers and listeners, um, what the most unexpected application of their design expertise has been over the last year. Hmm. Leave your comments down below. Um, really curious, as always, to hear what people have to say about this. Linda, when people want to continue this conversation with you, what's the best place to reach you? Uh, for now, they can, they can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. I'm at Linda uh, I'll, it should pop up on the screen somewhere. I always forget if it's left or right, but it should be here. And for the people who are listening to the uh, audio version, it's in the show notes. Did we forget anything, Linda? I don't think so. Good. Then I really want to thank you for spending the time with me on this uh, on this day, sharing what's on your mind and um, addressing some of the bigger issues uh, for our, for the design field. Thank you as well, and uh, stay safe, stay healthy. So coming back to Linda's question, what is your most unexpected application of your design expertise? Leave a comment down below and let's continue the conversation over there. If you found this episode interesting and helpful consider sharing it with at least one other person today that way you'll help to grow the service design show community and that helps me to invite more inspiring guests like linda here on the show for you if you want to continue learning about effective skills and strategies that help you to build services that win the hearts of people and business check out this video because we're going to continue over there see you